Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lecture 6, Amphibian Reproduction, Growth, and Development. So today's lecture is going to be focused all on amphibians and how they reproduce. And I would encourage you, again, to use your field guides as a reference and pay particular attention to the amphibian natural history section that's focused on reproduction. It serves as a really great complement to today's lecture. So the first thing I'm going to do is stop sharing my, or stop my camera. I remember how to do that and jump right into the lecture. Now, the ability of organisms to reproduce and maintain their genes in future generations is a key feature that separates living from non-living things. Sexual reproduction provides the opportunity of variation. And when I say variation, I mean genetic variation. And this allows natural selection to operate. Now, organisms cannot predict the environment in which their offspring will survive or develop. Therefore, they have to compensate by producing lots and lots of offspring. And these offspring are all different from each other, somewhat slightly, again, because of the way genes and are, are reshuffled during reproduction, and again, providing this opportunity for adaptation and changing environments. Now, amphibians have evolved a diverse and solutions to enhance their reproductive output. So for example, Amphibians display a spectacular diversity of reproductive modes, and we're going to talk about some of those really spectacular diversity uh, here today's lecture. Fertilization can also incur, occur inside or outside of the body of the females, and again, we'll talk about ways in which that occurs. Also, development can be direct or indirect. Now, these three things should already be somewhat familiar to you as you've read a little bit about them as you've been following along in your field guides with respect to the natural history of our amphibians, whether they be salamanders, frogs, or toads. So let's talk about how this occurs, and let's focus on gametogenesis and ovulation. In most amphibians, two sexes are needed for reproduction if you're having sexual reproduction. Although there are some pretty remarkable exceptions, such as asexual reproduction, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in lecture. Now, each sex must be reproductively ready. They must be mature, and they must be at the right time of the year for them to reproduce. This timing has internal controls, but ultimately it's coordinated by the environment. So for example, changes in temperature or photo period may help spark the beginning of a reproductive cycle. Now, gametogenesis is a major feature of sexual reproduction preparations. This process is similar in all species of vertebrates. It involves a division and growth of gametes within the ovaries and testes through hormonal activation. Now, betelogenesis is an important process in egg-laying vertebrates. It involves the accumulation of nutrients in the cytoplasm of the developing egg. These, late, these uh, nutrients will later become the yolk and feed the offspring. Now, during the last phase of beetlogenesis, the growth of the oocytes are very rapid. And prior to ovulation, the mature egg is 10 to 100 times of its original size. Now, ovulation occurs when the follicular and ovarian walls rupture, thus releasing ova into the body cavity, where they migrate into the oviduct. As they pass through the oviduct, various membranes, protective membranes, are deposited around those and the number and layers is species specific. Now, it's important to note amphibian eggs are anamniotic because they lack the extra embryonic membranes that are so characteristic of our reptiles and our, our birds, as well as our mammals. It's also important to note that eggs can be expelled singly in gelatinous masses or in strings. But again, the important part is they have no calcified shell. They're anamniotic. As I mentioned, the number of layers of protective membranes are species specific, as well as the types of egg masses that are laid. So here you can see this gelatinous egg mass of wood frogs. Here you can see the egg mass of a tiger salamander. And I really like this photo because you can actually see some of the protective membranes. Here's one, there's one, and there's one. So you can see three layers with a naked eye. There's actually quite a few more. And then of course, as we talked about earlier, if you see these paired strings, you know that that's an amphibian uh, egg mass produced by our American toads or Fowler's toads. So let's talk about fertilization. 
Fertilization is the penetration of sperm and fusion of male and female pronuclei, hence restoring the diploid or two in condition. Now males produce millions and millions of tiny spermatozoa, whereas females produce a lot less of their ova, hundreds or even thousands. And that's largely because eggs are much, much larger than sperm and they're much more costly from an energetic standpoint to produce. Now during mating, many sperm can reach the egg surface, but only one will penetrate the cell membrane and fertilize the eggs. Now there is an exception to this and that's found in our salamanders and that's called polyspermic fertilization. Now sperm have enzymes in their heads or their acrosomes, which digest egg membranes and make a tiny hole in the egg capsule. Sperm pronuclei then move into the cytoplasm of the ova. When this happens, the ova completes its final meiotic division and the, and the two pronuclei fuse, hence forming a zygote. Now there's two types of fertilization in amphibians. There's external and internal. With external, the gamete fusion occurs outside of the body. Now, when I say external uh, fertilization in amphibians, immediately a couple of different families and groups ought to come to mind. For salamanders, it's, it's not the norm and it's only found in Sirenidae and Cryptobranchidae in Indiana, but it is the norm in all of our inurin species. All the frogs and toads in Indiana have external fertilization. Internal fertilization is found in the other six or eight species of, or six or eight families of salamanders. And so if you think about our ambisomatids or our, our plethodontids, all of those big families have internal fertilization. And there are a few species, a few families of frogs that have internal fertilization, but they're found only in the Pacific Northwest. So let's focus on external fertilization. And again, most frogs and cryptobranchids are, are hellbenders, are prob and probably the sirenids have external fertilization. Now, if you think about external fertilization, it does constrain where the eggs are laid. They must be laid in an aquatic environment. We know that because they're amphibians. It also requires the simultaneous shedding of eggs and sperm in the water. With external fertilization, males release a lot of sperm on the eggs as they emerge from the cloaca of the female. Now in frogs, males can grasp females in what's called amplexus. And I'll show you amplexus here in just a minute. Uh, and that amplexus is where the male will wrap his arms around the female in some location and, and position himself just above the female's cloaca so that when she expels her eggs, he can expel his sperm and fertilize the eggs externally. And that's another reason if you think about frog genders, the male frogs usually much smaller than the female. So one, he doesn't drown the female in the water and two, that his cloaca will line up perfectly with her and allow the fertilization to be more successful. Now with salamanders, they can also have implexus. It may or may not occur, but again, it's allowing the, the males and females to deposit sperm over the eggs. So here's some examples of implexus. So here we have our wood frog and this is called inguinal amplexus where the male has his front legs around the upper waist of the female underneath her arms and this in the our, if you look at our eastern newt we have cephalic amplexus where the male takes his hind legs and wraps them around the female's head what about internal fertilization internal fertilization happens in a few species of frogs remember those are the ones found only in the pacific northwest and then the major salamander families that we have, particularly plethodontids, ambistomatid, uh, our salamandrids, and as well as all Sicilians, which we haven't talked about in class. Now, internal fertilization differs from external fertilization in that it allows the eggs to be laid in a spot and at a time of choice. So now the female has the eggs fertilized inside of her body, so she gets to decide when and where those eggs get deposited. So that is certainly an advantage over external fertilization. Now for frogs, the four or five species of frogs that do have internal fertilization, again, those Pacific Northwest, it requires special intermittent organs in males to deliver the sperm inside the female's cloaca. With respect to salamanders, the male will produce a spermatophore. I'm gonna show you a picture for spermatophore in here in just a second. Now these spermatophores are actually deposited externally 
and it consists of the proteinaceous pedidal capped by a sperm packet. Males have really elaborate courtships which stimulate females to actually pick up these sperm packets. They pick up the very top of these spermatophores and those spermatophores tops are then stored in the female's cloaca. And that st sperm storage organ is called a spermatheca. And these are often sperm storage tubules on the roof of the cloaca. And the sperm storage can be anywhere from a couple of days, a couple of months, and in some species, almost a year. So here's what our spermatophore looks like. Here you can see the base, there you can see the stalk, and the top is the cap where all the sperm are located. And this is the portion of the spermatophore that the female will induct or, or pick up with her cloaca. This is actually a spermatophore of a tiger salamander out in the wild. Again, you can see this proteinaceous base and stalk and this white cap with millions and millions and millions of sperm that the female is going to pick up. So, so far we've only talked about sexual reproduction in amphibians, but asexual reproduction does occur. And this is reproduction that occurs without the male's genetic contribution. And in some taxa, populations can consist of 100% females, no males in the entire population. So there's two types that I wanna cover. The first type is hybridogenesis. The second type is gynogenesis. So this is a really important schematic. I encourage you to spend some time looking at the salient differences between a bisexual or sexual reproducing species and then here's our two asexual reprodu reproduction, hybrogenesis and gynogenesis. And so with our bisexual, our normal sexually reproducing, if this is a female, she's a big A, big A. Here's our male, A prime, A prime. When they go to reproduce, the female will, will allocate a big A, a male will allocate an A prime, all the progeny are A, A prime. Well, let's look at hybrogenesis. Hybridogenesis, is the consistent production of only female offspring where the sperm of a male of a bisexual species contributes parental chromosomes to the progeny, but those progeny only transmit the maternal chromosomes. So if we have a big A, big B of the female, big B, big B of the male, here's the female's A, there's the male's B, and here's the progeny, AB. But when this particular progeny goes to reproduce, they only pass on the big A genes from the female. The chromosomal parental contribution is ignored. So in these populations, they're all female. Now remember, again, just to make it clear, the males are contributing chromosomes to the progeny, but those progeny only pass on the maternal, the female contribution. The paternal or the male contribution is lost during uh, reproduction. What about gynogenesis? Gynogenesis has a very different mode of operation. It still yields all female offspring, but it's the consistent production of female offspring where the diploid or triploid eggs are only activated by the sperm of the male. No chromosomes are incorporated into the embryo. So here's the big A, big B of the female, big B, big B of the male. The male sperm activates the AB deposited by the female but is never ever incorporated into the developing embryo. It's never part of the zygotes. Whereas hybridogenesis, it's incorporated and later purged. Gynogenesis only activates cellular differentiation. All the chromosome, all the chromatal, chromosomal content comes specifically for the female. So these are 100% clonal matches of the female. So these populations could be stemmed from one female and a male that's gonna be serving to act activate differentiation using his spermatophore, his sperm. So it's a really confusing process. And I, at this point, I want you to be thinking about which of these processes make more sense from a long-term evolutionary standpoint. A sexual species, which we know in, incorporates genetic variation inherently, or clonal, which are clonal replicates of the maternal in this case. So some short-term advantages, if you're thinking about what proportion of your genes are being passed on, these two asexual are certainly better competitors. 100% of the female's genetic contributions are being passed on. Whereas in a sexual species, only 50% of the, 
of your maternal chromosomes are being passed on. So from an evolutionary short-term benefit, these asexual reproducing species have the advantage, but there's some obvious disadvantages. What if this population often all of a sudden has a new disease or some stochastic environmental situation? These populations are all clonal. They all have the exact same genetic contribution. So therefore they may not be able to adapt as well as a population of sexual species that are all genetically slightly different from one another. And so from a long-term evolutionary species perspective, sexual reproduction oftentimes carries the day, while whereas asexual reproduction has some short-term benefits, but doesn't usually persist for more than five million years, which is relatively long uh, from a geological standpoint, not long from a geological standpoint. So let's talk about gynogenesis. And an example that we have right here in Indiana and right here in Tippecanoe County is with our unisexual ambistema complex. So this was a hybridization event that occurred 5 million years ago. There is no current hybridization going on among any of our ambistomatic species. But 5 million years ago, there were five parental species. And those five parental species are Jefferson salamander, blue spotted salamander, tiger salamander, smallmouth salamander, and streamside salamander. And I do want you to remember which of those five species are the parental species that resulted in this unisexual hybrid and bistema complex. Jefferson, blue spotted, tiger, smallmouth, streamside. And so what's really interesting is that the ploidy number varies in this unisexual hybrid complex. We have two N individuals. We have three N, four N, five N, which means some of these guys have five different copies of the genetic contributions of five different parental species. It's a remarkable system and it gets even more complicated because sometimes the mitochondrial DNA contribution consists of one species, whereas the somatic contribution may be for additional species. It's incredibly complex and we really don't understand how this hybridization complex really established itself some 5 million years ago. But we do have some all female populations of this unisexual complex right here in Tippecanoe County. And sometimes depending on whether it's a three N, it could have two Jefferson genomes and one blue spotted. So it looks more like a Jefferson salamander, or it may be uh, a four N with three blue spotted genomes and one Jefferson genome. So there's all kinds, there's actually 17 different combinations that have been identified to date. It's a really bizarre complex. So let's talk about parental care. Let me first define parental care for you. So parental care is any form of post ovopositional, post egg laying, parental behavior that increases the survival of offspring at some expense to the parent. Most amphibians show no parental care other than nest construction for, uh, for deposition. Now there's a couple of different types of behaviors that are associated with parental care. The first is nest or egg attendance. And this can be attending for, for the purposes of aerating aquatic eggs with their gills. The next is nest or egg guarding. And this is where individuals, whether they be males or females, aggressively attack conspecifics that approach the nest. Egg brooding species are species that retain embryos somewhere inside their bodies. This involves retaining the egg or larvae on the body of the, or in the body of the parent. They may be carried until the eggs develop or until they metamorphose into froglets. It's pretty variable. We also have egg or larval hatchling transport. And we oftentimes see this in, in what is widespread in frogs. Uh, in many species, the eggs are transported. Uh, the tadpoles can be carried on the back of one parent. There's lots of videos you can YouTube that looks at uh, egg larval hatchling transport of frogs. I encourage you to do a quick search on that. And you can see some really remarkable footage. We also see feeding of young, which is exactly what it sounds, where the adults will actually bring food and feed it to the young. So let's take a look at some, some really cool examples. Uh, the first on the top that you see is our Australian gastric brooding frog. The eggs are actually brooded until the uh, tadpole or froglet stage. And so the female would, would consume the eggs, the eggs would then incubate inside of her body until they hatch in these tiny 
uh, uh, froglets, they actually metamorphose and then jump out of our mouth, which was a remarkable feat. But unfortunately, the Australian gastric brooding frog is no longer with us. It became extinct several decades ago. The midwife toad on the bottom left is really interesting and the male will actually intertwine the egg string around his hind legs and he will carry those from aquatic environment to aquatic environment. So the male is always carrying these eggs with him until they hatch and he can deposit the tadpoles into a water body. The Suriname toad is really bizarre, whereas the female will lay eggs, the male will take those eggs and rub them on his back. His skin becomes really absorptive and engulfs and completely absorbs those eggs. And the eggs are starting to develop underneath the male's skin until they're ready to hatch. When they're ready to hatch, they burrow up through the male skin and into the water column. So again, if you want to watch a really cool video, search for the Suriname toad egg hatching on YouTube, and you'll get to see these things hatching right from the male skin. It's incredibly bizarre. Well, let's talk about development. Most amphibians are exotrophic. Now, exotrophic means there's only a limited amount of yolk in each of the eggs but it allows the female to lay a greater number of smaller eggs. So a larger number of eggs, but each egg receives a smaller amount of yolk. Now, exotrophic zygotes display very rapid differentiation with little growth, which makes sense, right? Because you can only grow so much in an egg if you have limited yolk stores. So this oftentimes means that exotrophic have these really small, numerous eggs with limited yolk that usually hatch really quickly and the larvae must then feed themselves to fuel the completion of their development into metamorphosis. And I know you're familiar with metamorphosis. It's the shift from aquatic embryonic and larval stage to a more terrestrial growth and maturation stage. Essentially, think of it as the transformation of larva into miniature adults. And it usually involves a change from aquatic to terrestrial life. Uh, and it is initiated hormonally, but several environmental factors can also trigger this. Something like crowding, or lack of food, high predation, uh, the drying up of your vernal pools, all of this can trigger metamorphosis in addition to hormonal changes. Now, if you think about salamanders, some of our uh, salamanders that have indirect development have these external gills, but as they metamorphose, they reabsorb those gills and either rely on, on lungs or they may uh, rely on respiration completely through their skin. Now, metamorphosis in frogs is quite drastic as you would imagine. They lose their lateral line that they had as tadpoles, their gills disappear, they develop lungs, they grow legs, they lose their tail, and they begin a much more terrestrial lifestyle. And the last thing I want to talk about is pedomorphosis. So pedomorphosis is the retention of juvenile characteristics as an adult. So let me say that again. Pedomorphosis is the retention of juvenile characteristics as an adult. Now there are two types. I am not going to ask you to remember which, what the difference between these two types, uh, but I do want to point out that they are different. So progenesis is the acceleration or sexual maturation relative to the develop, rest of development. So you, you accelerate sexual maturity relative to your somatic growth. Whereas neoteny is a retardation of somatic growth with respect to the onset of reproductive activity. Okay, so those are the two differences and it gets really particular and specific. So I, I don't want you to focus on that. Really just focus on that pedomorphosis consists of two types, progenesis and neoteny. But um, from an umbrella perspective, the pedomorphosis is what we're gonna use in this class and it's the retention of juvenile characteristics as an adult. And you should already be thinking about some of the salamander families, which one of those are pedomorphic. And the first one that should come to mind is the Cyranidae. The next one that came, comes to mind should be Cryptobranchidae. So let's talk about growth. Growth is essentially the addition of new tissue in excess of that required for the replacement of damaged tissue. And there are two growth pulses that I want us to think about, embryonic and juvenile. Embryonic growth is increased when there is abundant, high quality food. And if you're an egg in an embryo, what is that high abundant food? It's yolk. This growth phase is very much influenced by ambient temperature. Higher temperatures typically cause faster development. 
but for extreme temperatures will slow growth. So go back and think about our ATR, activity temperature range, where we see we, we have these uh, maximum and minimum temperatures by which amphibians can exist. That occurs throughout their life, whether it's embryogenesis, whether it's metamorphosis, or whether they're adults. So in general, the warmer temperatures tend to allow these yolk, these embryos to grow faster up to a point, and then it begins to, to decrease growth because it's re reaching those thermal maximums. It's also important to note that juvenile growth is much slower than embryonic growth because of an unpredictable food source. The other thing I'll just say about growth in amphibians is indeterminate, which means it's never ending. So if you think about our hellbenders, which live for 30 years, all 30 years, those individuals are still growing, they're still getting larger. Now, obviously, from egg laying up till about 10 or 12, 13 years, that growth is quite rapid. And from 13 years to 30 years, that growth has greatly decreased because most of the energy is now focused on reproduction, but they still will gain a couple of millimeters in length each and every year. Very different than what we see with mammals, right? Once we reach our teenage years or early adulthood, uh, humans tend not to grow in length anyway. Wait, a different story. Well, let's talk about age. Absolute age is not as important as the time required to, meet, to reach major life history events. So what are some of these major life history events? Well, larval period to metamorphosis, embryogenesis, sexual maturity, those are what we're really focused on. So what about sexual maturity? It can range anywhere from four to six months, up to seven years. Em embryogenesis time, this is under incredibly long, our strong natural selection. Think about some of our scaphiopodids, the scaphio scaphiophidae. They can, re they can lay their eggs, the eggs can hatch, they can metamorphose all in a couple of week period. That embryogenesis and metamorphosis larval period is incredibly truncated because of the habitat conditions in which those species have evolved. So just keep that in mind as we talk more about growth and, and uh, survivorship and amphibians. So I really like this particular schematic. So here we see the taxon on the left, how big they get, the age in months of which they reach sexual maturity, as well as their maximum age. So let's think about age at maturity. It's a compromise among a lot of variables and two major port opposing forces. So one of the things you can think about, if you look at this schematic, some of these species, nine months by the time they reach sexual maturity, you think that might be the best evolutionary solution is to mature and reproduce quickly. That's a phenomenal strategy, right? But my question to you is, is that the best strategy versus something like a hellbender that takes seven years to mature? Okay, so you automatically should start to see the differences. This one is reproducing before they're a year old. These take seven years. Also, if you tend to mature very, very quickly, you oftentimes mature at a very small size. And we know that the female body size is directly related to the number of offspring she can produce. Smaller females produce smaller offspring. If you're larger, when you reach sexual maturity, your propensity to produce larger numbers of offspring are much greater. So right away, you start to see this trade-off. Smaller body sizes, smaller offspring, larger body size, larger offspring, but it takes more time. The longer it takes to reach sexual maturity, the greater probability you have of getting eaten or getting killed or not producing at all. So those are those two opposing forces that I was talking about. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go throughout the class as well. So a couple of things I wanna talk about before we finish up here today is that there's a multitude of patterns geared to the right environment of offspring. In general, temperate species are cyclic, right? Because we have four seasons. We have a spring, a fall, summer, and winter. Tropical species can be cyclic or acyclic, depending on what the, the particular environment looks like, whether they're mountainous or whether they're lowland. Temperate species, temperate salamanders in general, we have a winter spring mating and egg deposition. If you think about our ambistomatids, our mole salamanders, or our late summer fall mating uh, with our plethodontids. And again, you've read about that already in your herb field guides. So let's talk a little bit about mate attraction and selection. 
Location is usually not a problem because of synchrony and tendency to aggregate. Uh, we've already talked about how many of these species will aggregate to breeding sites so that they have full access to their mates. Reproduction tends to be more efficient within a home range, but sometimes movement is necessary if uh, access to suitable environments uh, isn't suitable locally. Courtship has communication as a key. We have an entire lecture on courtship and what that looks like and what information individuals are gleaning from the courtship. And as we've already talked about today, females have a really heavy investment in gametes, which obligates her to select the most fit male. So hopefully today you've gotten a pretty good appreciation for the different types of reproduction in amphibians. It's incredibly diverse, it's remarkable. And when you take the different types of reproduction that amphibians have and you couple that with the different types of communication strategies in which males and females are assessing one another, it truly is a remarkable system. And I can't wait to, to share with you the different types of communication of amphibians. But for now, we're gonna stop. Uh, and then I'm gonna get ready to record the reptile reproduction lecture. And so we'll see you next time. Bye now.